this is Jason Hershey, Designated Broker and Managing Member of TELUS Real Estate Solutions, LLC. Welcome to Landlord 101. This video series comes from our live Landlord 101 classes. In this video, we'll talk about choosing among prospective tenants and the screening process. And as in the marketing video, we'll touch on fair housing issues. Another issue we touch on is how to handle denying tenancy. I hope you enjoy these videos and find them useful. Be sure to visit our website, tellusre.com, and give us your feedback so we can improve our classes and these videos. So showing Thank your you. property. So here's some tips for you. So when you, so you're going to set up an appointment to meet your tenants. I want you to keep control of your schedule. Uh, as a landlord myself and as a new landlord, and I see it with my clients when they're new landlords all the time, they're very anxious to get it rented, and so somebody calls them up and they, and they say, hey, can you, meet, can you meet me in an hour? Sure, I'll go drive and meet you in an hour. And then the prospective tenant doesn't show up. You know, and after this happens a few times, they're miserable. And they go, wow, this landlord stuff sucks. <laughs> what I would say is keep control of your schedule. Say, you know what? I'm going to be free Saturday afternoon, and I'm going to set my schedules for Saturday afternoon. Say this to yourself ahead of time, and when somebody calls, you say, yes, here, I'm going to be at the property from this time to this time. Your appointment is for 1.30. You know, you know, yeah, you can do some back and forth and say, oh, you're not available at 1.30, how about 4, that type of thing. Or you can even do it for a different day. But the, you know, but the point is, is, keep control of your schedule, right? Make sure that you have the applications available at that time, if you haven't sent it to them in email or something like that. Uh, you want to be safe. Uh, so male or female, I recommend having another person with you if at all possible. You know, it's more important if you're female, but, you know, but either way, uh, no matter what, get phone numbers and names of people. So if somebody has called you and it's not on the cell phone and you have their cell phone number right there, get their phone number. Give their name and phone number to somebody else so that, you know, until you're, you know, if you're meeting with somebody alone, you say, well, I'm going to go meet this prospective tenant. I'm going to call you in a half hour. Or better yet, call me in a half hour and check on me. And then if you don't answer the phone, then they can start calling around and maybe calling that prospective tenant and say, hey, did you meet with, did you meet with Peg? You know, oh, okay. You, oh, you did. Okay. Okay. That's, that's good. And then hopefully, and then you can find out what's going on, that type of thing. Uh, the other thing to do, uh, oh, so use that appointment as your first screening step. If the tenant doesn't show up for their appointment, do you think they're going to pay their rent on time? And, I, I, and it happens every time. Uh, what, my last client who bought a rental, it, it, she, she learned very quickly because she had two or three people not show up. And she went the extra mile to, co to call them and say, hey, are you going to be here? And, you know, either they, you know, shine her on or they wouldn't give her good information or whatever. And they just, she ended up finding good tenants who showed up on time for their appointments is what she ended up doing. So use it as your first screening criteria. Uh, other things to note is that I like to keep pens and all my applications and stuff at the property uh, because inevitably whenever I don't do that, I forget to bring them with me. And there's nothing worse than going up to the tenant, you know, and meeting them and saying, you're a great tenant. Oh, I don't have the applications. We're going to have to meet or I'm going to have to email it to you, those types of things. So, so let's say that you've priced your property appropriately and you've got all kinds of calls and you've got lots of prospective tenants. How do you choose between them? So first, don't be in a rush to choose the first tenant. Okay? You know, if you have your criteria, wait for the people who meet your criteria. Do and set your criteria. And in fact, Washington State law, one of the newest laws is, you have to tell the tenants ahead of time, before they apply, what your criteria are for choosing tenants. Okay, so you, need, you have to provide to them in writing what, what the criteria are for choosing tenants now. Okay. Typically, your standard is going to be based on their credit, their finances, whether or not they have a criminal background, uh, and whether or not they have pets, those types of things. Whether or not they're willing to follow the rules, basically, that you have set up. Um, and, you all, and again, you've got to remember, to follow, remember those fair housing rules. So your criteria cannot be based on a violation of the fair housing rules. So you can't say, no kids. You know, you can't, you really can't even say, 
no one, you, often what we get in the class is, well, I've got a two-bedroom house. How, can I limit the number of people? Yes, you can do that. But if that ha even has to be objective. And you don't have to list out that particular requirement as it comes up. But, like I said, typically what you're in, in the back of your book, the very last page, is a sample set of criteria that I give my clients as a starting point. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, uh, a friend of mine owns a rental property on the same street, just a few houses down. Uh huh. And he uh, suggested that we use a property manager that he's been using to do placement only, which means that they. Will you pay them a commission for finding you the tenant. Yeah, and screening, and they do the screening. Okay. So. Um, that seemed to us a good idea because all of this stuff about the fair housing thing is fairly scary um, to me. Mm -hmm. um, well, hopefully it'll be less scary after this class. Well, I've already had one class, and I, it okay. actually was scary, mm -hmm. even, I mean, especially after the class. And then I read, started reading, and then I see these advertisements in Time Magazine, full-page ads, saying, have you been discriminated against? <laughs> Call this number. We'll sick the feds on your landlord. Um, <laughs> Uh, but a, a second part of this question is, um, I do want to limit the number of people in the house. Now, there is a, you know, the Uniform Building Code, right? It's right. now the International Building Code, the IBC. Um, there is a requirement that you have 200 square feet of usable space for each person living in the dwelling. That, doesn't include things like cabinets and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, so the property manager, when I was having a casual conversation with her, told me I could not uh, limit the number of people in the house to anything that I could limit it to two people per bedroom. Well, it's a four bedroom house, but it's only like 1,200 square feet. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want eight people in there. Right. I want five, I want to limit it to five. Is, is that, as far as you know, legal? I'm going so to have the, to ask, but... And so I, I know where your property manager is coming from. Yeah. So your property manager is using... And so what I, my answer is, as long as your standards are objective. So if you can put... If you can reference some government regulation, building codes, I can, and say... I can reference there's chapter nothing, and verse on the international building. Perfectly code. fine. I, that, that's objective. You can say, you know, I'm not discriminating against families, you know, and, and keep in mind, I would say this is people, not kids, right. that you're limiting the number to. Uh, most likely what your uh, property manager is using is the HUD guidelines for Section 8. Right. Uh, which right. I referenced right. in this class is that, because it, it says for Section 8, right. the property has to have, you know, can't, you know, has to have one, children have to have one, one bedroom, you know, boy, you know, boys over a certain age have to have a bedroom to give them right. themselves, and girls, right. you know, have to have a separate room, that right. type of thing, and, right. and two people per bedroom, right. things like that, you know, so, right. you know, and those are all perfectly. But that's section eight, that's right. not like the whole world. Well, no, but, but you, but it's a, but it's a HUD standard, so right. you, even though you're not you accepting refer, section eight, it's an objective standard right. you can reference. Okay, I understand. Yeah. So it keeps you out of trouble. You can say, I'm just using the same standards as the government's using. You're right. You know? Okay. I mean, that's the main thing is objective and, and evenly applied. Right. I'll be honest with you. Usually where I get this question is, uh, and it's been, this is the third class where this has not, the statement has not been made, and I love it because I think it suggests a change of attitudes. I'll get people, I don't want some Mexican family coming in with a whole bunch of people. They'll say that almost word for word. And I'm like, okay, you just lost my interest in the conversation by saying a race or a nationality or anything like that. National you know? origin is one of the things you're not allowed right. to do. Yeah, and so, and, and so and my assumption is when they state that is that they're more concerned with the national origin than they are with the actual number of people. You know, because why did they say the, you know, or maybe they just associate, I don't know, you know, there's certain stereotypes, but yeah. So as long as you, you, long as you use your standard objectively, you know, and, and it's evenly applied. That's that's not my answer to it. So, 
you know, and your property manager, you can't, you know, and they can choose to not do, you know, not to represent you because they feel like that's, you're not being fair, but, mm -hmm. but it's your house, it's your property. Okay. You know, my personal opinion is that uh, if you, if you do what we're talking about, mm -hmm. you don't need to pay somebody else to do that. I know. So, yeah. I know. So, if, uh, Because they can get you in trouble, just as much trouble as you can get you. <laughs> If, if somebody, you know, meets all standard criteria, they say, man, that guy's really totally bad energy. You got no choice about, you know, um, rejecting someone just on who you want in your house? Well, I, w I don't, I personally wouldn't trust those feelings, you know, or I wouldn't depend on those feelings because, I mean, what, so, will somebody automatically sue you for that? It's always possible. It depends on how they feel about what you did. You know. So, I mean, you do want, I mean, you know, if you can quantify the bad vibe that you got from somebody, they stank. They were dirty. You know, they were late. They were belligerent. All of these things are objective statements. If you say, I didn't feel good about this person, then, the, then, then it begs the question, why didn't you feel good about them? Did you not feel good about them because they were middle-aged, bald, heavy white guys and you don't like them? Or because they're a certain nationality or a certain race or a certain sex? All well, of these stinky things. people are okay. You can reject on, you can reject on stinky. You could, yeah, right, exactly. Because that's, you know, that's, a, you know, that's a reasonable uh, objective standard for a rental. Gee, if somebody's not clean, they're not going to keep my place clean. So that's, you know, and so far, you know, stinky isn't a protected class, you know. You know, and there's, and every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> usually, usually my comment is more like smokers. So, uh, you know, somebody is a smoker or they smell like smoke. You know, clearly there's a smoker. This is a no smoking house. You know, I am concerned that they will not follow my no smoking rules. Well, so thing. And smokers are not a protected class yet. You know. uh, on the credit, uh, can you go in and ask for the financial statements to know how solid they are? As you can ask for anything you want as long as you ask everybody for the same stuff. Okay. Typically, um, here we go. We're going to cover credit checks, so let's, okay. let's, so let's do that. So credit checks. So there are issues with credit checks. Uh, the biggest one being privacy issues, whether or not you're able to get somebody's credit report. In most cases, most credit screening companies, if you're going to get a copies of somebody's uh, credit report, they're actually going to want to do a pretty extensive review of you to the extent of uh, if it's the Rental Housing Association, and they're doing it, and they're going to give you a credit report for somebody, they're going to come and inspect where you're storing that information. They're going to inspect your house. You know, that type of thing. So there's very, because there are very extensive rules for handling that type of information. So that's one of the concerns that you have. Uh, but yes, you can uh, ask people for pay stubs, you know, you know, hey, all my income is from, you know, investments. Great, show me your investment history. You know, all of these types of things. You just have to be fair about these things and apply these rules evenly. Now, you say, well, I'm not going to ask everybody for their investment, you know, records, you know, because most people, that's not part of, you know, their income. Okay, that's fine. You know, so if somebody does come to you and say, I'm looking for that, you can show that, well, I always ask people for their source, proof of, proof of income. If you never ask people for the proof of their income, and then you ask the one person for their proof of income, that's where you run into a problem. Does that make sense? Um, so one of the things that I recommend for clients to do uh, is uh, use most credit, uh, most uh, background and screening companies uh, provide a variety of products like the rent right model. So the rent right model is from uh, the Rental Housing Association. Okay, and it has a set of criteria that you can give your your prospective tenants. And what you get back on each prospective tenant, instead of a credit score or a list of what they have and have not paid, you get a red light, green light, yellow light. Red light means that according to the criteria which you have, they're, they're a no-go. You know, and that might be, 
you know, too you know, a certain number of uh, late payments or an eviction, <laughs> those types of things, you know, on their on their records. A yellow might mean they have a few less uh, late payments, but still a few too many to be considered a good risk, right? And then a green light it will allow, you know, doesn't have, require perfect credit. It's just a, a very limited number of negative issues. And so that one's a nice, easy one. What I do is I tell people, here's the criteria, and if you don't know if you meet them, go pull your own credit report. Don't ask me to do it. Because what I don't want to do as a landlord is get to the situation where I've got to make a judgment call. You know, so I've got somebody's credit report, and I'm looking at it, and how can I tell that this person who's got five lates on their credit card, uh, but has paid their, their house payment, you know, regularly, but then they got a foreclosure. Is that a better person than this kid over here who's never had credit, you know, and has no history? I don't know which one's better, right? And, I, and, it, and, it's, you know, and it's even harder when, you know, they're all very close. So, instead, and plus then you get into the issue of, you know, somebody explaining why this particular bill, they didn't really owe it, and so that's why they were always laid on it, things like that. I just tell tenants, here's, you know, I'm using this, this model here, here's their criteria, you're going to come back as red, green, or yellow, I don't rent to you if it's red, I probably won't rent to you if it's yellow. You and know. so then you're not storing their personal credit. And I'm not correct. storing, yeah, and that's the goal of it, is I'm not storing their information, and so the verification process for me to get the info is a lot less. So where do you find the rent right model? Right uh, rent right model is available from Rental Housing Association. Rental Housing Association. Uh, which is linked to in the back of your book. Oh, okay. So, I brought, uh, there, I love the Rental Housing Association. It's rha-ps.org. This is their newspaper. Uh, this is a newspaper for uh, the Washington Landlords Association. Is that a different outfit? It's a different outfit. They, all, they, they provide very similar services. Oh. Uh, Washington Landlords Association. My opinion is that uh, Rental Housing Association is the cream of the crop, very organized, very professional. This they, one? Yeah, they do tend to be a little bit more focused on uh, larger apartment complexes. But that's okay, because those guys are covering most of the cost for all these things that these guys do for you. Uh, Washington Landlords Association is more statewide, uh, but they just seem, I mean, you can even look at the newspapers, and, and the differences in the newspapers tells you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. you know but they still provide similar services. They both provide mm -hmm. uh, uh, all the forms that you need. They provide credit screening services, you know, all those types of things. Um, so you said you have those in the back? Yeah. Um, yeah so like online or whatever you can find them? Yeah, uh, and so here's some of the resources. And uh, in, in your sign-in, uh, make sure that I have your email address. Uh, and then that way, because uh, I will send you a copy of the slides, the handouts. Uh, there's some other stuff that I send, that I post online for you to, to look at. There's like a whole, I used to print out the handout from... Uh, LT Services, which is, a, is an eviction service that has a lot of great information about evictions, mm -hmm. and I just post it online and let you download it or look at it you know, the way you want. Why kill the trees? That type of thing. <laughs> so, okay. So the other thing that I like to do is uh, criminal. Make sure that to do criminal background checks. Okay, uh, for my standards. So I'm looking for sex offenders. And part of my criteria is no sex offenses. Period. Don't, I'm not interested in whether or not you were 15, 16, or whatever it was. Don't want a sex offender. Crimes, I don't want violent crimes. All right? So anybody who's been convicted of assault, I don't want a, you know, those people in my rentals. You know, among other things, this, this is a, a, a liability issue for you. So let's say you have a duplex or a small apartment complex, and you rent to somebody who has a history of violence, and then they do something and you knowingly rent to them, and then they do something to another tenant. Are you liable because you rented to them? Which is a scary thing because, uh, uh, the very uh, not in your book, but on my last slide, I talked about some of the, I, I mentioned some of the new things that are coming out. So there is a Seattle uh, city council person who is trying to make being a criminal a protected class. <laughs> That's nice. That's Seattle, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. So. What, what if somebody has a mental illness and you say, I don't want anybody who has a mental illness? No. No. It's, it's medical, because it's medical. Okay. So you can, um, well, I think we're gonna. I think we hit that one. And if if not, if we don't hit hit uh, medical issues in a second, uh, remind me. So, well, you know, you have to. Some people are crazy and violent criminals. I mean, there's the criminally insane, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to run to these people. Well, and, and criminal, like I said, my criteria is criminal background. So if they're criminally in, so I think the part the the, the key term there is criminal. Okay. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and the rent right, they actually, they check that. The rent right, right, yeah, rent right doesn't, but yeah. part of the rental house, all, almost all screening services, including the Rental Housing Association, will also do a criminal background check. Okay, yeah. so you can get, that's a separate thing from the rent right credit check. Yeah, almost, yeah, almost all screening services will uh, have pa different packages that they'll provide for okay. you. Okay. And these can range from, we'll simply do the credit check, mm -hmm. or they'll only do the criminal background check, mm -hmm. or they'll do both, or they'll do those things and do an eviction okay. uh, search. Uh, they'll even, uh, if you want to pay, uh, pay them enough money, they'll call the references for you. Okay. You know, all of, they can do all of that for you. Okay. So, but very much what you're doing with the, uh, with the perspective, with the, uh, the property manager. Okay. Idea. But in fact, that's probably thing. all the property manager is doing is going out and hiring these guys to do all probably, that work. Probably. But you could also charge the person who is coming in. So right. for the, for the cost yes. of the check. Okay, right. yeah, it is in there. <laughs> so. um, and yeah. so on that, so if you ask the RHA to uh, do a criminal background check, do they come back and tell you exactly what it is? Because there's like, what about the minor offenses? That was one of the things on your last slide. Right. Which is a good question because do you actually care? They'll, they'll, they'll come back with whatever shows up for that person. Okay, so if they will actually tell you this guy punched the lights out on his wife and he also got busted for pot or something right. like yeah, that. Yeah, whatever, if that's, yeah, if the criminal records provide that level of detail. Okay. Um, yeah, happily, so, so by telling people up front that I'm checking for these things, 99% mm -hmm. of the time they don't apply. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, you, more of the problem is that you get somebody and the information comes back and it's because it's the same name and then you kind of make a, you got to go, okay, was this really, because very, sometimes they'll give you information for somebody else and they'll tell you, we don't know if this is the right person, but it's the same name, uh -huh. so we're going to give it to you. But then you can kind of tell, oh, look, my guy, you know, has a history of living in Washington State and this crime was committed in Florida. Right. You know, three weeks ago, right. I, you, know, okay. I, you know, that type of thing. Okay. Yeah, but 99% of the time, it's not a problem, simply because I'm checking for it. But you still check for it. <laughs> so, okay. so where you want to go to get the credit check or the criminal background check is the Rental Housing Association. Uh, so in the list in the back, there's several places. So Rental Housing Association will do it for you. The Washington Landlords Association will do it for you. You have to be members for either one of those to do it. Okay. Uh, but there's also, uh, in the back, there's... Uh, it's right here. Yeah, so there's Washington Landlords, Accurate Credit, IQ Data, are also places that do, will do this for you. What's the charge on something like that? So the charge, typically uh, for, uh, typically 35 to $40 per for adult. a full package. Per adult. Per adult, per person. Per prospect. Per prospect, yes. And so if, if you have a course. man and a wife um, applying, well. you... Each one of them have to pay thirty-six dollars. Okay. Yeah. And the prospect, do you say the prospect absorbs the cost on that? Yeah, we each charge yes. down for it. And we'll, in fact, we're going to cover that in a second too. Okay. Okay. So, um, so income requirements. So, what you want? So, what are you interested in income requirements? You really want to make sure that they have enough to pay their rent plus their other bills, and you want to make sure they have enough to pay their other bills so that they can pay their rent. So, you don't want a tenant who has to choose between paying you and paying the electric bill or paying the water bill. So do you include that monthly rent when you say, okay, I happen to know that the utilities is going to be at least this, that, and this. Right. Um, and so when I say uh, minimum monthly income twice the rent, and I charge, say, my, say I'm wanting to get $1,200 in rent, and I happen to know those utilities are going to be $500. Right. Do that, I really want to 
Well, in this case, I, so for me, so I what you do is really up to you, and it, it, and, it does, and as long as you apply it evenly, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, but in my case, I'm saying I say double the rent, and that's because I that double that so. So if it's fifteen hundred dollars in rent, I want to see at least three thousand dollars a month in income. That way, I know they have the fifteen hundred dollars to rent, plus another fifteen hundred dollars to pay the utilities. Right. Okay. You know, whatever they. So you are. just set, you just yeah. pick something and stick with it evenly, and it's okay. Right. Exactly. Okay. And most people will do. Uh, I would say twice income is a little light. So you might want to say you're twice the rent. You might. Uh, some people do three. You know, two and a half. Yes, yeah, so anywhere from two to three is what you'll typically see. Two, I'm sorry, two to three months? No, no, no. Two to three times or the rent. The two to three times the monthly rent. Right. right. Okay. For income. All right. Uh, so rental history, you want to know, so do they have evictions or not? I'm not interested in tenants who have a history of being evicted by their landlords. Whatever the reasons were. And you will get people going, well, I was evicted because the landlord had it out for me. I don't care. <laughs> How do you check for that, whether they've been evicted before? Well, uh, so part of the screening process, if they've been evicted by going to court, it'll show up in the court records when they're doing the screening, okay? okay? If they've been ev ev formally evicted. Otherwise, one of the things that you're looking for is references. You're looking for rental history. I want to see, <coughs> you know, in your application, you're going to say, show, you know, give me the information for your last landlord and your, or your last two or three landlords. You know, and it's a red flag if they won't give it to you. Uh, we'll caution to you uh, about last landlords. So many landlords won't give you a lot of information. You know that's just the reality. You know uh, that you know because they're worried about being sued. The bigger problem is that if you've got somebody who is a bad tenant, and so let's say you've got a bad tenant, and you want to get rid of them, and somebody calls you and says, "Hey, I'm doing a check on this tenant. What are you going to say? Are you going to be honest and say they're a crappy tenant and, and know that you're stuck with them, or are you going to or are you going to say, "Oh yeah, they were a fine tenant and say and say good riddance." So that's one of the things you got to watch for. So I would pay more attention to not the last landlord, but the landlords previous to that. So, yeah, that's it's probably one of the hardest ones to get, right? Because just because getting hold of the landlords, you know, whether or not you can trust what they say, whether or not they're willing to say anything to you. Generally, most people are very bad. Most people are pretty bad liars. I know I, or maybe it's just me. You know, so when somebody asks me about a previous tenant, I have a trouble, you know, being complete, completely dishonest. If somebody was a bad tenant, you know, if you if they start hem hemming and hawing about saying they're, in, if they were a good tenant, they have no problem saying they were a good tenant, right? If they were a bad tenant, they might start going, oh, well, you know, they had their issues, and you know, you know, mostly they were good. Then you start wondering about. So, how do you set a criteria for uh, they were a pain in the butt to their last uh, uh, landlord? Uh, you could say no evictions, paid, you know, uh, good, you know, positive, you know, no negative reference from your previous landlord. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit softer. You can just simply say had to, you know, you know, needed to pay all your previous rent on time. You know, for a lot of my tenants, that's not really my requirement that they paid all their rent on time. I'm mostly interested that they didn't tear up the place, you know, and you know, and that they and they weren't, you know, constantly late. They didn't get evicted. I'm mostly looking for did they get evicted, or did they get a lawsuit after them afterwards because they left the place trashed. Okay, uh, and again, we're going to you know fair housing rules, so apply them, you know, apply whatever your criteria are, apply them consistently. And again, don't you know if if your criteria sound like they might be focused on race, you want to think about that. You know, you want to make sure that you're not doing that. You don't want to think about it, you just don't want to do that. Religion, uh, family status, sexual orientation, uh, ha so handicap and sex. So, so uh, handicap, so medical conditions. So as a landlord, you're required to make appropriate accommodations for, for medical issues. So if somebody, let's say, somebody's in a wheelchair and they need to put up, put in a ramp. You don't have to put in a ramp for them, but you have to let them put in a ramp themselves. You can't say, sorry, this house can't accommodate a ramp. You can say, you do it, and it has to be to code, and it has to be at your expense, but you can't say you can't do it. 
Now, and if they do make modifications to the property for that, they have to return it to you in the condition they got it. So if they put in a ramp, they got to take it out when they leave. Those types of things. Those, those are fair rules. So, you know, if somebody, so if somebody is mentally handicapped, as long as they can live on their own, then it's not really up to you to say they can't, you know, that's, that's a doctor's decision whether or not they can live on their own, not yours, mm -hmm. you know. So what are you going to do about the uh, uh, medical pot smokers now? No smoking. <laughs> Uh, no, no smoking. Smoking uh, one, is smoking. No smoking. No smoking. So, so, we were talking about this, and, and I'm debating whether or not to send a letter out to my, to my tenant. So one, as far as I'm concerned, so, this, so I am a, in many, many ways I'm a screaming liberal. There are certain things that I'm not. One of them is the drug thing, so I voted against it. Okay. So uh, it is still a, it's still against federal law. So as far as I'm concerned, it's still a crime. You know, and until it's not a crime. It's, not only is it a federal law, it's an international law. So Washington State is, about, is, is putting the United States at odds with treaties that it has already signed up for. In order to make pot legal in Washington State, the United States will have to withdraw from certain international treaties. So, as far as I'm concerned, it's still illegal. Washington and Colorado, is it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but and mostly because they haven't been challenged by the feds yet. So. <laughs> Now, like I said, but that so uh, I have a, I have a no drug policy, so no no crime and a crime free drug free, so and I as far as I'm concerned, pot's still a drug. Now, reality is, what can you do if people are doing? I'm not watching my tenants 24 hours a day, but I'm going to tell them up front, you know, pot's illegal. So if I come in and I smell it or I see it, I'm going to evict you. Even if it's been. Even if it's you know, you no start getting is no <clears throat> medical isn't as far as I'm concerned, it's still illegal. Now, okay. you know, and, and I will tell people that up front because I think it's much easier to fight it up front if that if it's a concern to you. Mm -hmm. You know, not all landlords are going to feel this way. You know, but I would say tell tenants this up front versus trying to fight because once your tenants in, trying to fight them on a medical marijuana would be pretty challenging. You know, I think you would probably lose if you tried to evict them for it, right. to be honest. Well, However, I can still say you can't smoke in the house. Right. <laughs> I have a no smoking policy. Well, I do. You can also right. have no smoking on the property. Or you can say no smoking on the property. It's, so how That's else? totally up to you. If yeah. you want a complete non-smoker, no smoking on the property, then you just state that. Yeah. Smokers are not right. a protected class. Criteria. So th this is going to be this is going to be going to come up in court cases over the next few years well, and, get, sure you know, and get sorted out, and I don't know how. When you see the what judge was it that was on the other day saying that he smokes it daily, yes. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, so. Um, so. I just read someplace that if you, as a landlord, become aware that, uh, I can't find it now, but I have all these things I was looking over before coming to the class. That if you are aware of illegal activity, illegal activity occurring on the property, that you're obliged to report it. I mean, you have a legal obligation to report it. I don't know that that's Washington state law, but I believe that is policy, at least in places like Seattle and Burien and a lot of these places, especially with gang problems. Okay. So they have anti, a lot of anti-gang okay, regulation. Here it, here it is. Okay, this is supposedly out of the, I don't, can't cite you. It, it, right it could be. It could be Washington but State. But it says the landlord shall, says it is a crime for the landlord to know about drug related activity and not commence an unlawful detainer action and or notify police. Yeah. Good. I'm all for that. So. <laughs> but, but then again, as a landlord, if I know about it, I'm going to do those things anyway. I'm going to start because I don't want, you know, drug dealing. Well, going sure, on on my property. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The marijuana thing, you know, it, it's remains to see how it's going to pan out. Right. You know, because I'm not against my tenants having a beer, so you know, you know, and I and I know a lot of people, you know, you know, equate the two. You know, but again, as far as I'm concerned, at this point, it's still. But I can clearly say objectively that it's against federal law. Mm -hmm. So. So whatever you do. Uh, so for the handicap, so. And the handicap also uh, goes into the um, 
for, with pets and service animals. So service animals are not pets. Right. And even if you have, therefore, if you have a no pet policy, there is, you cannot have a no service animal policy. You know, and you can have, but you can ask for things like, uh, you know, a statement from a doctor saying you need a service animal. That's perfectly allowable. You know, but if you get once you get that statement, if it's if their service animal is a boa constrictor, it's a service animal. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, these are all things that have come up in courts. You, you know, I was going to say, it's, you laugh about it, but it's unbelievable what people will do sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, so choosing among tenants. So, let, so okay, you've gotten tenants, you've run screening, but you still got some a set of what seem to be fairly close tenants, you know, in their quality. So what do you do? How do you handle multiple applications and avoid a lawsuit? Uh, well, first of all, do you want multiple applications? You know, you may choose to say, you know what, I'm going to take one application at a time, and I'm going to run that application, and if that one, and then I'll take the next application afterwards. In most cases, this is what I end up doing. It, it's infrequently that I get five people applying for a property at the same moment, and then I, you know, you know, like they all showed up at the same time and I took applications from all five and I'm going to run all five credit checks. That just doesn't happen that often for me. Okay. Now that may be because I tend to start a little high on the rent and so the number of applications I get <coughs> is actually fairly small. That might be part of the reason. Uh, but the tip that I got from the, the attorney who taught oh, the, the first landlord class that I ever uh, attended was what he does is when he gets a whole bunch of applications at one time, he goes one, two, three, four, five in order. He processes them in order, and the first one that meets his criteria, that's the one he chooses. And he, does, and he stops there and he doesn't go to the rest. He says, hey, that's an objective way to do it, so that's fine. You know, If you do run all five and you choose the best one, just try and make sure that your definition of best is as objective as possible. I think that's a little challenging sometimes. I mean, it's great if you've got somebody that clearly makes a whole lot more money than everybody else, you know. But what happens if uh, applicant one has no children and makes, a, and makes $500 more a month than applicant number two who has children and everything else is equal? And then you say, well, number one makes more money. But applicant two might say, well, you know, they don't make that much more money. It sounds to me like you didn't like us because we had kids, you know. So it's, your life is much easier as if you're is if your, your process is a bit more standardized. Like, sorry, I took them in order, and I took the first one that's good. And when you take them in order, let's say you took it in one, two, three, four, five, make sure you say when complete. So if you get an application in, somebody hands you the application, I'm going to fill it out right here and give it to you. But you have the next person hands it in. If this one isn't complete, you can go on to the next one. Right, that's actually something that should be in my slides. Uh, that's part of your screening criteria, you know, that they gave you a complete application. So they gave you all the references, and they gave you the ID that they need to show that they're, you know, that they are who they are, they say they are. Because you're going to want to do that. You're going to do things like check their, their driver's license and make sure it matches what's on the application. <laughs> you know, those types of things. What if um, several people Several single people want to rent your house together. What I uh, so what I tell is there a liability the, for one? Then do you put no? What I tell so um, this came up in the last class and and the rental housing association got rid of this form, which is a bummer because I would still use this form and I would still have a statement like this and and, and it's called a uh, their their addendum was called a statement of the economic unity. What I tell my prospective tenants when there's more than one person and either they're roommates or they're just unmarried couple or whatever is you guys are one set of people. There is no, I want one check, I don't care who pays it, and if the rent is late, you're all getting evicted. Okay? And, but when it comes to applications, I get applications from everybody. Right? Because I don't know who's paying the rent. And I don't care how they've arranged that. Or how they've arranged the utilities. Or how they've changed, yeah, arranged the utilities. That's their problem, not my, it shouldn't be my problem. So 
you know, if there's five, if there's five people, or you know, like more common, this to me, it, I I like to explain it as the two people, right? Because two people could be roommates, could be boyfriend and girlfriend, could be fiancés. I don't know, right? And so I've got two people. They're on the lease. One of them moves out and leaves the other person, right? Well, what happens if the first person was the only one on the lease, but they left the other person there? How do I evict them? I still have to evict them. They're not automatically out, you know? And maybe they're the ones, maybe all the checks were written in their name. So everybody who's living in the house has to be on the lease. And I get an application from everybody, and I tell them, because you know what, I was one. I'll be honest with you. When I was a te uh, when I was in my early twenties, I was one of those tenants. I went two or three months with a landlord saying, "Hey, my, here's my half the rent. I don't know. You, know, you got to go talk to my roommate about the other half." <laughs> right, right. And it worked. And I'm like, what an idiot he was to do to let us do that to him. You know. So I. So I don't, you yeah. have to have one person that you, that is designated to write the check. I, I don't want that, the check. That, I say I get one check. I don't care who writes it. Okay. Because you're all on the lease. If I don't get, it's your all, I tell them it's your responsibility to get me the payment. A check, cashier's check, I don't care, cash, however you guys do it. But if I don't get it on time, you're all getting evicted. You're, you know, it's not like I'm going to evict Joe. And I, and, and I tell them, I will not accept partial payments. Mm -hmm. I don't accept half the rent. It's all or nothing. And if it's nothing, that's when the eviction starts. <coughs> because that is a, it's a, it's a common problem. It is common. Do, you, do you go through uh, a liar, liar to evict? I do. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, you can do it yourself, but uh, there's enough gotchas in the process that I recommend using a service. To do it. Uh, there's, there's guys who specialize in it, and, you know, because uh, if you don't go through it the right way, then it gets delayed even further and costs you more money. Right. So, uh, so denying tenancy. So you, so what happens? So you've gotten multiple uh, applications or just one, and come back and they're not approved for whatever reason or because you chose one over the other. So first of all. Provide them a notice promptly. As soon as you know that you're not going to rent to them, tell them. So that they, because this is somebody who's probably looking for a place to, to live, and they need to, and maybe they have their heart set on your place, and they stop looking. You know, so they need to go on and go find a great place to live. Especially if it was somebody who would have been a great renter, but you chose somebody else. You know, then let let them make some other landlord happy. Okay. If you've done any sort of credit check at all, whether or not that's the reason for it reason for the rejection or not, you have to give them a, what's called a notice of adverse uh, action. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever applied for a credit card in your life, uh, uh, at least in recent years, and been denied or for any kind of loan, um, they, you know, and if you were denied, you got a little letter saying, you know, we ran a credit check, you know, and, and you were denied, and, that, and the credit check may or may not have had anything to do with you getting denied, but as a result, you get a free copy of your credit report. That's just automatic. You know, this credit report sucks. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you why. <coughs> I just got a rejection from, uh, from a uh, uh, lender. And uh, because my credit report showed I, my credit rating was 850. It's too good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah no, they, they said right out front, right out front. No, I said, we're sorry, we, we, can, we cannot loan to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever. Well, apparently it wasn't because of the credit report then. Because well, an 850 right there that your credit report is the reason that you have been denied credit from blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I, could, I could name them. Well, the other thing is that uh, with credit reports, the credit scores, there's multiple credit scores. So they may have given you your 850, but on a slightly different scoring system. Because they have credit, uh, and that, this is something I just learned in the last few months, they have credit, not only do you have the different companies, but the different companies have different scores depending on what you're trying to do. Right. You have a different score for buying a car than you do for getting a credit card, for doing, for buying a house. So, all kinds of good stuff. But anyway, so that's something to know. So, you want to make sure to do to tell them promptly. Um, you know, the other thing that I like to do is, so, let's see, okay, so.
So uh, collecting fees. So you are allowed to charge your prospective tenants the cost of doing the screening. Okay? Whatever that cost happens to be. You can't, you're not allowed to make a profit off of it. It's not a profit center for you. And so whatever the cost is. Now the cost, you know, and so the obvious costs are, uh, you know, running, you know, a credit check, criminal background checks, things like that. You can also include in there the, the time and, and cost of making phone calls to check, you know, if you're checking their landlords or their employment and things like that, you know. Now, what is that cost? I don't know. I don't try and tack on that. I just charge from the cost of it. I charge them my real cost, my actual cost of running the credit report. Now, the other thing that I like to do, if I, if I do get a couple of tenants in at the same time, uh, like I said, I take that approach of, I, I will tip, because you can get a response within 24 hours on the credit, on the, on the screening. So I run, I, I, I tell them, I'll let you know, and it, it, it may take a couple of days, is what I tell them. It may take a couple of days. And I run, run the first one, and if it comes back good, I don't do the second one. As, you know, as long as they meet my requirements, that, I, I take that approach, the first one that's good, right? And then the next one, I say, I call them up and say, you know, we chose somebody else. Uh, you know, I want, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you your check back. I'm not going to charge you for the screen. You know, even if I ran the screening, I still do that. Even though I'm, I'd rather be out 30 bucks than to, than to anger somebody. Because that's when people come and do lawsuits. Is there any, you know, if you, if you either do or don't run the credit check, and you give them the money back and they're not out anything, chances are you've just diffused whatever uh, piece of upset that they had over not getting that place. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, you know, nothing, you know, it's understandable somebody, you know, is a little angry that they just spent 40 bucks or there's two of them and so they spent 80 bucks, you know, and then they didn't get the place. Do prospects expect that cost? Is that common, common practice that... Uh, any renter would say, okay, they get, they know they're gonna pay that. Yeah, most, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it depends on where you're renting. Any, almost any place that's actually doing those checks is charging those fees. You know. So. You see it like in the paper, or Craigslist. It, and I, you see I, it all the time. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, it's a forty dollars credit check. It, People will advertise that. Right. You know, yeah, that's I, what they it's, charge it's part of all that other stuff that I put in there. Yeah. I say, uh, you know, I'm, I charge you first, last. I, my standard is first month's rent, last month's rent, a deposit equal one month's rent, and a whatever. And then, you know, and I call up the screening company. Hey, what's the fee? Or I go look online and see what it is now. You know, oh, okay, it used to be it used to be thirty bucks. Now it's like thirty seven or something like that. And it's thirty seven dollars. Say thirty seven dollars per applicant. Uh, uh, for you know, for credit credit and criminal background check, you know, and then and again, that's another part of your screening process, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I will, and when I do cash those checks, I will use. I like to go to their bank and cash them immediately, and not to, and because that's another part of my screening process. Did their check bounce? <laughs> if their screening check bounces, they're not a good prospect, no matter what anything else says. Right. You know, those types of things. Plus, if you take it to their bank and it is going to bounce, they're not going to charge them a fee and, and you're not going to incur a fee from your bank for depositing a check that bounced. Things like that. They'll just, you'll take it up to the window and they go, oh, there's not enough funds to cover it. Oh, okay. And now you just know. That type of thing. Okay. So, conditional tenancy. So, what happens if you get a tenant, so if it's a rent-right model and they come back yellow, or you got a tenant, you know, and you are doing a credit check or Something they say, you know, I know I've got problems, I've got a cosigner. Well, what do you do? Well, the first thing I'm going to ask, well, how good is your cosigner's credit? A cosigner who's got worse credit than you do is not a very good cosigner. So you're going to want to run a credit check on the cosigner right. and see, you know, if it's their parents or something like that. that that's the kind of situation you will typically see cosigners is uh, I see it with young people who have no credit. You know, or you know, or their only credit is the uh, cell phone bill that they never paid, that type of thing. And so they, their parents are going to uh, co-sign for them. reasonable accommodation to make. You know, or and I've also seen it in cases of divorce. You know, one spouse is moving out, the other spouse wants to get rid of them, <laughs> but they that but they don't have their own credit. They've only got you know community credit that type of thing. And 
so you know there's the other spouse saying yes I'll co-sign it those types of things are, uh, yo are young people without a credit history automatically then out of the out of the picture because they can't be criteria right I mean very often you know it depends on your criteria I mean, most most cases my criteria don't work well with young people with 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 people who have no well so they don't work well for people who have no credit history. If that person happens to be young, you know, yes. but is not, I am not purposely targeting not having young people as renters. No, of course not. <laughs> so, but yeah, but, that, but that's the result is that, yeah, it, pro it, it could very, I would say it probably hits young people more heavily than it does, you know, um, you know people who have a longer job history, that type of thing. Yes. You know. Although nowadays, you know, most, uh, you know, and I'd have to look at the, the credit. Uh, they may come. Back, I think they're going to come back as a yellow. They're not going to come back as a red. And so you may be asking questions. You know, and and generally when you're talking to the person and meeting them, they may say, "Well, I don't have any credit." Oh, okay, well, you know, then you can talk about what's going to happen if that, you know, is the case. What I do is, uh, people, anybody, you, I, anybody, every year you can get a uh, your a copy of your credit report uh, from each agency for free. And I always and I always have that web address handy, and say here you know, go check your own credit report. By the way, it is not freecreditreport.com. That's a place where you have to pay for it. <laughs> so. You go directly to Experian. Uh, no, well you can go. It's uh, the the government mandated website is called annualcreditreport.com. Uh, that's the one that the federal government mandated that takes you, and it's a central portal that takes you to the Experian. TRW and uh, whatever the other is. Type. So, uh, the other thing that you might do is you might ask for extra deposits from people. Hey, you know, you're, you know, if you want to cut somebody a break, you know, you say, well, yeah, you're coming back as a yellow, you know. So, you know, you, and you said that you have, you know, you don't have as good a history. You might be willing to rent to somebody and charge them an extra deposit. And you can do that again as long as you have an objective reason to do it. I, you know, your credit history came back yellow, or it's not as good, those types of things. All right, and you might ask for people for more than the last month's rent. Hey, if you're willing to, to give me two months extra rent, you know, to assure that if you don't pay your rent, I've got, I'm covered for two months, great. Yeah, I'll still rent you. You know, if you want to cover your risk, you know, in some other way. There's nothing wrong with doing that. I don't do it, but you yeah. So Section 8, Section 8 is a government uh, uh, subsidy. Program so somebody comes and the government pays part of the rent. That's a great deal as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I don't particularly like the program. I don't have any uh, tenants who are in the program. Not because I don't want the tenants that are in the program. It's just that there's some paperwork and some hassle involved in getting it set up uh, that I've never bothered to go through. And I've always had enough tenants scrambling to be in my rentals that I've never need needed to do it. So government pays part of the rent. They pay part of the market rent. Uh, and I would suggest that. Uh, they're paying part of the higher end of the market rent because uh, at this point uh, Section 8 is not a protected class. There are lots and lots of bills uh, in front of uh, both Seattle, King County, and the state to make uh, to force landlords to treat Section 8 the same as any other possible income. Uh, which my problem is with that is that there's more work involved with Section 8 up front. Um, uh, so uh, there are income requirements for the prospective renters, they're lower income, but, uh, and typically what you're going to do as a landlord is ignore, uh, so let's say that your requirements are twice the monthly income, so if you're doing Section 8, they're going to come and say, well, I've got a, a voucher for $700, your rent's, you know, $1,500, so you can say, well, then you need to have twice the $800, for example, because you're guaranteed getting the $700. That, it's that kind of thing that you're going to do. Um, all your other requirements would be the same as for other renters. You can still you can still do a, a credit check on them, perfectly allowable, you know. And then you know you can't be a criminal, drugs, things like that. Uh, there are some requirements for the house. So this is where we were talking about uh, some of the objective criteria that you can use as a landlord to to limit the number of people in the house. Uh, so you have to have a kitchen and you have to have a bathroom, you know. And, and they have to be separate. <laughs> so the kitchen, the bathroom cannot be in the middle of the living room. 
there has to be one bedroom for every two people. Uh, there has to be lockable windows and doors. Uh, has to be free of vermin. There has to be heat. And there's some other things. And there's a whole uh, handbook put out by King County for it. And it's, and, it apply, and it's a federal program, so the King County handbook works for anywhere. Um, generally, so generally what, uh, what happens with Section 8 is somebody comes with Section 8, they say, do you accept Section 8? You say, yeah, I'll accept Section 8, but then your, your property has to get inspected, you know, and get approved. And so that takes time. And so what I've always done with, uh, you know, and somebody has to actually make that happen. So whenever I get a tenant who says, I have Section 8, I say, great, here's the deal. I'm not going to hold the property for anybody because I want to get it rented. Uh, I'm not currently approved. I think the property would be approved. If you want to help coordinate that, great. And then I go rent to somebody else because that never happens. <laughs> you know, it's not because I'm mean. It's because I want my property rented ASAP. And I and my again, my properties will rent fast enough because I keep them nice and clean. I'm a great landlord that I don't need to. You know, I've got somebody lined up, ready to go, to pretty quickly. So that's kind of the issue with Section 8. But in the future, that's liable to change if, uh, if they do these rules where you have to accept Section 8 the same as anything else. Then probably what I'll do is make the effort to actually get my properties pre-inspected. So, and, and a lot of landlords target Section 8 because, again, they, they will cover part of the market rent, but usually because of the limitations, it's the higher end of the market. The market rent is not one price. It's a range. right? And so. If you're at the upper end of that range and you've got part of the rent guaranteed, that's a pretty good deal. It means, you know, what it really means is that you can get a little bit more rent than what you would have. This is Jason rent. again. I hope you enjoyed this video from our Landlord 101 series and found it educational. Be sure to check out our other videos and provide your feedback. Please email or call if you need any help with your commercial or investment real estate needs. Again, thank you.